Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone at our weekly DCS seminar, uh, the Agelonian. Uh, today we kick off a new semester with a distinguished guest, Mikhail Torup from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mikhail is one of the leading researchers in uh, uh, TCS in general and in algorithms and data structures in particular among a number of results. I, I, I would like to mention one close to my heart as, as well. So uh, with Jacob Holm and Val Rottenberg, you, Michael gave an oracle for reachability queries in planar diagrams using uh, n log n bits in general. Yes, also in an older paper, he showed how to put la labels of uh, length log squared n to answer such a reachability queries. This result we try to beat or improve for already a number of years here in this group. Uh, uh, Mikkel works also on uh, on uh, graph colorings. Uh, his work with Kenichi Kawarabayashi on uh, coloring free colorable graphs in in polynomial time with as few as colors as possible. He, they hold the current record with the number of colors being n to the one fifth, where n is the size number of vertices of the graph. So Mikkel has a number of uh, contributions with the classical algorithmic problems like k-median, k-center, facility location, things that we learn in, uh, in course books uh, that we read about. And today uh, we are joking that there, there is some biblical uh, uh, application or, or insp inspiration for the problem stated here. But, but at the end, you, you will all see, uh, we will see that it's a very natural, clean uh, statement with a, with a breakthrough result. Thank you, Mikkel, for for coming, joining us here, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the introduction. And yes, let's uh, just skip the top part, although I like it. Uh, but it's Darwin's words about this kind of work. We'll see that. Uh, but it's about fitting distances by tree metrics. So the proper taxonomy is really very old. I think we've all heard about Plato and Aristotle was sort of discussing these things. How could they classify things? It's some kind of a hierarchy with animals, red blood, no red blood, uh, different ways of uh, doing it. And this is very systematic work of Linné who, who gave this uh, uh, thing for plants. And, uh, and then we have Darwin, he's good at drawing. Uh, he also tries to find out how to put things. The big difference is that the two, two first ones are sort of more just trying to put things together because it's mentally useful. Like if you can if you can make some kind of right classification of things, then it's somehow very nice for the brain, nice to work with, but not because there was any innate reason for it. It was clear that discussion should be here or there. Uh, but here we start caring because there's a truth behind it. I mean, in the sense that you actually believe that this is an evolutionary process. So each of these branching points uh, Correspond to some ancestor or something like that. So it, it, it has a more full meaning. And in connection with computers, as soon as they started, people started working on it, where they basically said, we have some measured sense of distances between the species we see today. Can we try to guess what is the evolution in the past? So you would sort of imagine that things that are closer to each other uh, should have a lower common ancestor than things that are far from. So let's get to the math and to the, the subtitle here. So we're dealing with a, what we call evolutionary tree for some cell species S. So it's just an edge weighted tree uh, with leaves at S. The distance from the leaf to some internal node can be just zero, it doesn't have to be long. Uh, and now the path distances in the tree induce a metric on S. Okay. So here's an example. Uh, and it was my student, Vangelis, who made it. this beautiful example here, but we have a metric here on these species here. And here we have a corresponding uh, tree and it's actually a perfect match. So when you add up these weights, you get exactly 436, which is what you find here. That's in the path from the monkey to the elephant. And the hyrax, which is the closest uh, relative of the elephant actually has a short distance of 63. Okay, so this is also the ideal situation. But evolution is not perfect and we have noisy measures. And so maybe something, even though this was sort of the evolution that happened not with the edge weights, but just the branching process, 
then it turns out that some of these distances are not quite what we would have liked. Okay. And then there is no matching tree because there's this four point condition of tree. So if you have a perfect match on four points and you change just one entry, then there cannot be a perfect match. So that's why it's easy to see you can't do it. Okay. And here is some concrete error. And then the basic thing is that if you have a tree with small errors, then that's a good candidate for the underlying solution. Okay. And they actually care about this. So the first argument I did. Uh, more than 20 years back, uh, Martin Farage and Mike Patterson and stuff like that. And I discovered that uh, my brother, who was a first year bachelor student in biology in Copenhagen, was using it without knowing it was me who had made it because it got implemented in all this software for large genetic database. I mean, they use this kind of stuff when they want to classify COVID and stuff like that. It's a, it's a quite serious problem. Uh, and of course, you can use that to uncover any kind of evolutionary process. Uh, and then this view, which is the original one by Aristotle and uh, Plato, that if you can classify things, then they used to understand. So that was true uh, for humans, but it's also true for computers, because at first we had a tree describing a metric, or approximately describing a metric, then we can answer any question in the internet time, basically. Not everything, but a lot of questions. So uh, if we have data that we think are generated by an evolutionary process, then there should be a tree approximating it quite well. And then we want to find it. So in general, of course, with metrics, you can't expect it to be a good tree, but you may have reasons to believe that it exists, and then we would like to find it. So the sort of formalization of the problem is to say, well, we know we have errors now, we should somehow weight these errors, and uh, you can basically do it in any LK norm, right? So you just look at the sum of errors to the case and then take the case of that. So, if k is uh, infinity, then it's just a max norm. If it's one, then it's just the, the, well, yeah, the one norm, the sum of errors, and that's what we're going to look mostly at this paper, in this talk, and this is actually sort of the most combinatorial version of the problem. And then sometimes we're very interested in the case where the tree is an ultrametric, so that it corresponds to saying that all species are at the same distance from the, U, the root. Another way of saying it, and that's how mathematicians normally say it, is that uh, the distance from uh, x to y is the max of the distance from x to z and the distance from z to x. So not just bound, not just uh, the usual triangle inequality, but actually uh, an equality to the max. So um, this was uh, the first was raised from a, a two, and then it was raised in a one. It's a huge industry. Uh, so deciding if there's an exact match is easy for a long time. It's just been known for a long time. Uh, but it was also known to be NP hard for both trees and ultrametrics on level one and level two. That has also been done, known for many years. And it's easy to show that the similar proof is APX hard. So almost everything is APX hard, except for one. And this is a magic paper. I'm going to get to it. That for the infinity norm, you can actually find an optimal ultimate. And then uh, Martin told me, Martin Farage, Colton told me about that. And then we uh, actually solved it for the infinity norm with trees. And this is what got implemented in all the uh, biology software batteries. Uh, but our thing is actually more general. It basically says for any norm bigger than k. If you have an alpha approximation for ultrametrics, then you have a three alpha approximation for tree metrics. So since they had alpha equal to one for the ultrametric in infinity, that gave us a three approximation. It didn't give us anything else. I was very happy Martin suggested we should put the general result in as a quotable lemma because it might be handy one day and has proved handy for many people later. So for finite norms the dream is to get a constant approximation for ultrametrics. We can't hope for better than that. And if we can do that, then we also get a difference. Lots of results. Uh, so, so again, these were the only results known for a long time. So people have especially tried to, to work on L1, and it's been the most popular one to work with. And people got down to square end approximations. But the latest result was Island and Terika, who got down to for k equal to one. A log n times log log n approximation. And for higher norms, it's really just 
the moment they approximate, and then it is just a log n times log log n approximation for any norm. But then you get to the square of the k root afterwards, and that's how you reduce it for higher k. But it is just a log n times log log n. And uh, the paper is just writing about L1, but saying the same method generalizes. And they asked if it was possible to get down to a constant approximation. And this is what we did here quite recently. And for me, it was exciting because when I did the previous soda paper, I actually thought L1 would be impossible to get below log n. But somehow, uh, my beliefs were shattered later. But that was when we didn't understand log n approximation yet. It was you know, in the beginning of all this uh, hardness of approximation and PCP and stuff like that. So it was, I just thought we didn't have the methods yet. We we're waiting for them to develop in order to be able to solve the problem. But then it turned out the solution was completely different. And we have no, yeah, it was in America for so long. So I'm almost about to say fucking too, but we have no clue how to do for any other finite norm. Okay. Then we just know it's somewhere between these two. So, so this is, I think, a very beautiful problem, and I don't see why we can't solve it. But, uh, now I'm sort of convinced it's a constant fact computation. But it's very similar, uh, analog to the problems that um, uh, Dr. mentioned earlier there, right? If you think of something like facility location, you want to have K facilities, right? We have the K center that corresponds to infinity, and we have the K median that's L1, and we have the K means that's L2. There, you're also trying to approximate a metric in the sense you just map it into k values. Everything gets mapped to an appropriate value. So it's sort of a little bit similar to the situation. I mean, a lot of work in theory in computer science is about trying to map things into some easier space, right? And again, k sensor is trivial. If the affinity is trivial. Then L1 was pretty hard and took another 10 years to do L2. So it can happen. You just have to follow that path. So, I sort of swap things. Okay, I must have said the whole version. It doesn't matter. Okay, so let me first talk about this real, this general reduction. Okay, so it's actually, in hindsight, a very trivial thing. I know people in approximation said it worked out very hard for a long time, but the idea is very simple. We basically have some pre metric T and some distance matrix D, and we want to turn it into an ultrametric. And what we do is just we pick some people, some species A, and then for each species, we add an edge from the species I to I prime with weight, the maximum weight minus the distance from A to I. So from A to A prime, since A was a pivot, we add the maximum distance. But for us, like this one here, it's very far from A, almost the maximum distance. Actually, it is the maximum distance. Uh, but then you just add a little bit. Okay, and now everything is at the same distance from this uh, root, which was the pivot. Okay, so, so then we can say, well, what actually happened to, to D? So we get a corresponding D prime, and we see we uh, have the original distance, and then we add two times the max, and we subtract the distance from A to I, this is from A to J. So we can sort of transform the distance matrix. And now comes the basic point, which is that if T approximate D, then D prime is also close to T prime. And what is important here is that all terms, you can sort of see that if you try to average over all values of A, then everything, all distances from the original tree will happen three times. And for that reason, and that works for any K, the uh, the difference uh, in the cake norm of uh, the distance in the ultrametric is at most three times as big as in the original. I'm just trying to describe to you the techniques, which in this case are wonderfully simple. Okay, so this is a general reduction. There are some details, but that's it. And then there comes this the thing that was also the first really cool result. I, at some stage, I decided to swap them, but I must have forgotten it again. But so, how do they do that? Because I'm actually trying to tell you some of these general, these different techniques are plays in this area, right? Because in some sense, if you could do L1 and you could do infinity, why can't you do L2, right? We know how to handle maximum distance. Why can't we just somehow merge or something like that? And it is really beautiful. So we want to find uh, uh, some uh, ultrametric that minimizes the maximum distance. 
So we can say, well, that's the same as finding an ultrametric that dominates. Instead of D, we just take epsilon away from all entries. Okay, so now we are, we're just trying to find a minimal thing that dominates that. And then if that doesn't go more than two epsilon above, then we are all good. Uh, but that's all the shows that we have a unique maximum, but we do because it's just a minimal, makes a minimal spanning tree problem. So we, we take this one here and we do a minimum spanning tree. And then we look at the maximum weight. So in this case here, if this was a minimum spanning tree, this is maximum weight. Right, and what we know, we know that all species that are separated by this edge have to be a distance at least six from each other. Okay. So we make a group at height six half, just because we have to go up and down. It's annoying with this little difference. Okay. And then uh, under the root, we put a subtree for each of the components that you get if you remove the maximum weight. There's some things to prove, but again, I just want to show you this is actually very simple. I mean, the good old days of approximation, very simple algorithms, just rock. Uh, now everything has to be done by LPs and stuff like that. And I will do that as well. Um, so that was sort of really the previous techniques getting down to constant time. And now I want to focus on this constant approximation for L1. And it's actually rounding the same LP as they had. We just rounded a lot better. So we actually get a so we actually, it, imp it implies that the integrality gap is constant. Uh, but we only do it by one. What we do, nothing of it works for any different norm. And we'll get to why that is. And in fact, I'm going to change problem again. So I started with trees, now it's just ultrametrics, and now I'll just work on the hierarchical correlation clustering problem. And it's actually something that has been implicit, and LP is even given for it, but nobody's really focused on it before, but we will. To define it first, we talk about correlation clustering. Correlation clustering, well, we have a, you know, we're trying to find some partition or clustering, and we just add all the edges within each set. So each uh, cluster is just turned into a P. Okay, so the correlation clustering problem, we're given as input just a set of edges, and we want the partition so that the click, corresponding click edges, the symmetric difference between those and the input is as small as possible. And it's known how to do this within a constant factor. It started off being a big constant factor, now it has become smaller. But just to make sure we agree on the problem, here's an arbitrary edge set. Here's an approximation with three cliques. One is very small, but it is a clique. This one here, and we see we lost this edge, we lost this edge, and we added this edge. So the symmetric difference is three. I think it's the best one, who knows? But at least now you understand the mesh. Now we want to uh, define a hierarchical correlation clustering. So we say a bunch of partitions, uh, a sequence of partitions from P1 to PL. I think of P1 as the lowest one is hierarchical if the lower ones subdivide the higher ones. Okay, so this is how we define hierarchies. And now we have a hierarchical correlation clustering problem where we, for each of, we think of these as level. For each level, we have an arbitrary graph. We have some weights that are really just annoying, but it helps coding other problems. And now we want to find a set of hierarchical partitions that minimizes the sum of these symmetric differences from before, right? So for each level, we have the correlation clustering problem, but we have an edge set that we want to match with a bunch of things. But now we have this additional requirement that the partitions on the lower level subdivide those on higher levels. Okay. I don't want to bother you with this thing, but it generalizes an ultrametric. It's very easy when you have an ultrametric problem to code it by this problem. So this is the one I want to focus on. And I think it's actually a fairly natural problem. If you like hierarchies, then uh, this is what you want to do. So we want to make sure you are, we want to understand what we're talking about here. So here's a bunch of input graphs. Here's a, a a hierarchical partition, it's easy to see it's hierarchical, right? And we can then add up the costs. So here we lost the, we lost this edge, right? That's one. Here we lost that edge and that edge. We succeeded in keeping this one. And here we have everything else going on. 
Okay, so this is a valid solution because it's irrigable and we have some costs. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the interesting thing is that first we completely ignore the limits. I mean, in a sense, we ignore the hierarchical requirement. We just for each level independently solve the correlation cluster problem. This gives us a bunch of clusters on each level. But we haven't asked them to be hierarchical yet. Then we use this as input to, to hierarchical clustering again. So now the, the difference is just that now the input to my hierarchical correlation clustering from each level is not an arbitrary edge set, but a bunch of peaks. And then I claim this solves everything. That if we can do this within a constant factor, well, this thing we knew how to do within a constant factor, that's already known. If we can do this step within a constant factor, then everything is within a constant factor. Again, this may not be hierarchical. This is the hard thing. And why is this? That's next, because that's just triangular equivalent. So the basic thing is we want to find a hierarchical set of partitions. Well, if we ignore the hierarchy, it only makes our lives easier. Right? So, so, so going over here is easier than going down here. But then it's just triangle equality that says, well, going here, back, down is only three times as bad as going directly. Okay, so that's all of the intuition. So if we've got this one within a constant factor, we haven't lost too much. There are some calculations, but it's the same thing. Okay, so how do we do this hierarchical cluster for your problem? So that was again the thing. We're doing hierarchical correlation clustering, just assuming that the input is peaks for each level. And we're going to use an LP solver to decide which of these, I call them input clusters, that are really important. So this is actually the only place where, it's actually only the LP that really worries about the hierarchy. Everything else will be automatic. But it's the first algorithm to do something global about. So if you look at these heuristics that the biologists are using, they're just sort of going bottom up, pairing things and, and seeing what happens. But here we actually say, whatever you do, there has to be some super monkey somewhere. We don't know where, and we don't know exactly who the ancestors are. That could be some surprises. So a cluster is a concept that exists, but we don't actually know exactly who's below and who's above. But it sort of puts these important things in. And this is also why it could be combined with the heuristics that biologists are already doing. They just do everything as one global thing, but this says there's actually some structure you should be aware of when you do it. And for the rest, we prove that whatever you do, it sucks. And so we can't lose too much. But again, it's a very funny kind of rounding because we're rounding some variable variables that don't exist, but that's fine. So first, how do you formulate this thing as an IP? It's quite simple. Um, so for each level, we have some distances, X, I, T, L, uh, T, whatever, T. And if we want it to be zero, one variables, if the distance is zero, it means you're together. If the distance is one, it means you're apart. Okay, so this is a tri triangle inequality implies that we do get the partition. This is what forces the hierarchy because it says that distances only decrease of the hierarchy. Okay, so things that are together will be forced to stay together in the next step. And then we have an ugly thing here, but that's just the cost. Right? So what does it say? It says if you had an edge, that's things you want to be together, then you pay the more they are part. And this one says, if you did not have an edge, you didn't want them together, you pay them all there together. Okay. So that's just an exact IP formulation. This is why I'm saying this thing is an island in Charaka's article, and this is an exact IP formulation of the racket correlation plus one problem. They just didn't name it that way. And what is a little bit interesting, now I didn't read this, I didn't tell you the reduction for ultrametric, but what happens is, the edge sets you get from the ultrametric, they're actually hierarchical in the sense that if things are together, 
if you have an edge on one level, the same edge will be on the next level, but they're not like cliques. We shall actually exploit, but what we get is input uh, completely independent clique sets for different levels, and they are not hierarchical. So we need the generality of this hierarchical correlation plus correspondence that you do not get if you just look at optimal. Okay, so then there's a standard LP relaxation, and then we have this special thing where these edges comes from the uh, clicks. And this is what we're going to run. On. So we run the LP, and this of course gives us a, a bound for how much we can hope for in any optimal solution since an LP is more general. Now we, we sort of have some edges we think are more or less good. So we say that for an intracluster edge, that's actually, these are two things that were supposed to be in the same cluster in the sense that they were in the same set in Q. We say that things are very close and that's what we like if the distance is less than 0.01. If it's above that, that's a constant. Constants are expensive. Then they're really not close when you think of that that should have a distance of zero. And then we have these edges that go outside. So that's an edge to somewhere where you shouldn't have something. And we say that's way too close, or that's too close if it's 0.5, okay? I mean, you're supposed to have a distance of one, right? So that's a half, that's again a cluster close. So we may have a cluster like this one, and then LP says it's, I mean, five has a bit of a problem, but he has at least most of his friends inside, it's okay. A few edges missing, but we approve this one. This one here has serious problems, right? Because five is now going crazy about the, the people from outside, and that's not okay. So we kick him out. And, and then this comes sort of the nasty part of it. We have three who just doesn't have many friends, even within his own cluster. We kick him out again. So we only want these sort of completely boring people who just like people within the like everybody within the cluster and hate everybody outside. They're, those are the only ones we keep. And then we can have a situation like this thing where there's just too much trouble. So, you know, there are lots of guys who have way too many friends outside and some who don't like anything, we give up the whole cluster. So if we don't have a cluster where people really all love each other and hate everybody from outside almost, then we don't care for it. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of two points here. I actually like this one the most. So we said that things are very close if they're distance 0.01. And if we, and now we ask you to be friends for with the majority of the guys. Well, this must be that any two guys, there must be someone they are both very close to, which means this is 0 0.02. So they are very close. Everybody within a good cluster are close. And also LP pays a lot for these removed guys, right? So the LP, this five got kicked out because he had so many friends outside and each friend outside, you know, that's a cluster of one. And also if somebody doesn't have enough friends, the LP is paying a lot, which means we could do whatever we want because LP is paying so much, right? That's where we have the freedom. That's what I sort of said that, that things are important and then there are things we don't care about. That's where we can use the biology heuristics because we know no matter what you do, it sucks, okay? So why not use the heuristics? Because they actually like them, so we should let them use them. Okay, so now I'll be a bit more more formal, so we have these species, we have these partitions here, and we run the LP, which is again this thing that takes the hierarchy into account, has the global picture, but does fractional solutions, which is not what we want. Okay. Now we have these distance on every level, but we don't really care about the levels inside the algorithm. We, I mean, about what happens outside. We just take one level at a time. Look at all the clusters from the input. And now we say, we sort of clean it. So if somebody is not very close to at least half the cluster, we kick them out. And if somebody has too many friends outside, again, it's just uh, more than 1% friends outside, we kick them out. And if we ended up kicking out more than 1%, we throw them out. So things have to be really good before we keep anything. And that's it. Okay, so now we have some remaining clusters. If we don't have any, we also don't. Then we can just say that there's no tree or we say there's a single group and everybody sleeps, something like that. It doesn't matter what we do. 
So again, there are these guarantees, the distance from most point zero two. We have this thing that really things get a little bit messy here because we have the difference between the input cluster and the clean cluster, but we still have that, uh, that things that are close to one of these clusters remain is at most 2% instead of 1%. And then this important thing that if somebody got kicked out, LP pays at constant times the size of the whole cluster. I mean, that was a condition for kicking people out. Okay. And uh, similarly, if there's somebody who's too close, then on the average LP plays the size of the cluster for it. So if we decide to keep the cluster, but there's some people who are a bit too close, then LP pays a lot, which means we can afford to pay a lot. And now comes a reason why this is useful, why these clusters have some kind of hierarchy in them. Because if we look at two levels as lessons, then we cannot have an LP approved cluster A on level S below, which intersects two clusters on the same higher level. Okay, and why is that? So let's just assume, so these are clusters B and C, let's assume B is smaller than C. So we know that the LP distances decrease after they're also. And LP approved clusters have diameter at most 0.02. So by triangle inequality, this cluster C is all close to B. But B and C are disjoint. So these are outside friends. That's what we don't want. And C is bigger than C. So we should have kicked out B, right? Because everybody in B has more friends outside B than inside B. That's totally not allowed. So we would have kicked it out, okay? So, so this sort of indicates that this rounding we've done makes some sense, that somehow things are good. And in fact, we do have a quite simple algorithm to finish the job. So now we have these clusters. And this looks a little bit ugly, but let me just explain to you. So we have, we're going to develop some kind of tree, but we look at some node in this tree, we have a core cluster, which is all dark here, and then we have an output cluster that's a bit bigger. Well, we'll explain how this goes on. But in the beginning, we just, at the lowest level, we just have the species. They're all singletons, they're alone. Uh, and uh, so we just have the, the core plus and the output plus the same thing. Now we move up the levels. And we, uh, for each of these clusters that are, these are LP approved clusters, the one that we really care about. Okay, that we think are important. So, we create a new node, a new root node. And this starts off being the core cluster. And then we look at all the things we had from below. So we are building a tree, we're building a, a forest bottom up. We look at all the things below. And then there will be some different situations. Now we look at all the things from below where the core does not intersect this cluster. So the core is you know, the small inner part, not the outer part. And what we do is that if the core doesn't intersect, then we take the output cluster and remove it. Okay, so it starts looking like this. So we take these part away. And this is very important because otherwise it wouldn't be a hierarchy. I mean, a hierarchy, we want that the, what, what survives after this is again a partitioning. So we can't have these things. If, if this root is not above this guy, then they're not allowed to have anything in common. And we let the lower guy win in this case. So we give up including these species because they sort of belong to someone else. Okay. But we're not done, but we because we could also have some lower clusters where the core overlaps us. In that case, we take them over, we take them in as our children, we embrace them, and we include their output cluster and our output. And again, if you think of maybe it's even more natural described as a tree, if I take you as my child, then all your descendants are also my descendants. Okay, so our cluster is basically just the descendants. And that's it. So this thing gives a hierarchical partitioning. We've been very careful we made this thing that 
This guy includes all these things that go above. We move one step up at a time, and it's clear that we get a, a partitioning on each level. Some things just some, some things just survive from below. There is no core cluster on this level covering it. It just means it it's still this group is just lifted to the next level. Okay, so this gives a partitioning all levels and it's wow. Does it work? I mean, does it make sense? So we have one thing, at least this thing that we couldn't have two guys intersecting the thing, same thing below. That's why uh, it's well defined what comes out of this. It doesn't matter the order in which you do things, the results are completely well defined. Okay, so that was a very, that lemma was very important. Now I want to argue that so 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 what in general happens is right, I I'm sort of a core cluster, and then then I inherit a lot of descendants from my children, right? And they could potentially, and they were not necessarily inside of me already. So how large can it be? How much bigger can we get of, from all this inheritance? So again, the output cluster is just the union of the descending core clusters. I claim that we can only get 2% bigger. It's not much. So to prove this, let me just focus on the highest descending core cluster that doesn't intersect, right? So I come from here, I go down, and it's hard to see what's up and down, but bigger is higher, okay? So I first get to this child, then I get to this child, and I keep intersecting C, and now this is the first guy that doesn't intersect C. So what can we say? Well, Distances only decrease up the levels. And we knew the diameter of each of these guys was 0.2. So this means that all the blue stuff, these are guys with the sex C, they're within this ball of uh, diameter or radius 0.04. Okay. So they're not very far away. But gray intersects blue. So it's also not very far away. It's within 0.6. So by LP cleaning, so these guys are all too close. And we're not allowed to have too many too close, only 1%, right? So since blue and gray are all too close, they can only be 0 0.01 times C. And that was what we required with this kind of plea. So it really, and then comes the last thing, which is what about all the descendants of gray? Well, by induction, they're only 0 0.02. Okay, so if I just try to do a little, Thing here, what what we can have, what we can have is that here's a core, and then we have all these guys, and they don't move very far away. They only move at a distance of 0 0.04 away because it's still intersect. Then maybe they stop intersecting, and this could be extremely deep this hierarchy. So we could end very far out here, but they don't have much mass. And we could be in a kind of what looks like a crazy situation because we could have an, maybe an other guy here that where all his descendants are below him and he doesn't get anything because they all went to that guy. They were already taken. This guy gets nothing. But in order for him to get nothing, he better be very small. And in fact, he didn't exist because LP cleaning would have taken him away. So the conclusion was again that we only lost two percent, right? So this, this kind of cleaning we did ensures that when we later do this bottom-up thing, not too much happens. And LP also pays a ton for this, right? In the sense that because gray and blue were too close, we know LP plays the size of blue and gray times the size of the cluster, and then adding red makes no difference. So we actually if we pay the size of the cluster times every all this stuff we added to get from C to C plus, uh, LP plays that much. And the lesions, I love these pictures. It's uh, it was Vangelis who did them. So now we just want to do the same thing. We focus on the highest, the leading core clusters intersecting. We do it it's a slightly different. So red. Again, so so here's a guy that steals from us. Right? That's what we just talked about, like how we stole from this guy here. Right? 
So, so these two guys, they steal from us in the sense that their output cluster intersect us. So they're going to grab stuff from us. And now we don't want to deal with this guy. If we look at the, if they intersect us, then we can look from the things that intersect and we can find the first answers that they have, the last answers that they have that intersect us. Okay. And then we actually look at the parents, which are then the first ones that don't intersect us. And we only keep the highest parents, so we don't keep this one. Okay, so now everything that, if we look at the gray stuff, then we know that everything we lose is descending from the gray stuff. But we still have this triangle inequality that says that gray is too close, right? So we pay proportional to the gray stuff, and everything below gray stuff is only 0 0.02 times bigger. So we can't lose too much. This one, as I think I said, that's playing with the definition, but it also turns out that if you have something that just survives, if we just look at the last the picture at the beginning of the uh, algorithm here, right? So these guys just survive. We know they're all very close, right? Because everything inside, well, at least inside, at least everything within the core was the majority of it, 98% of it, is very close to each other according to LP. So if this doesn't coincide with one of the LP approved clusters, it means that, that the LP puts many things very close together that shouldn't be together. So the LP has paid so much. That's sort of one situation. Another is if it was one of those But anyhow, that also works out. But this part is just annoying, so we'll skip it. Um, I think it's much more cool with these pictures of these little worm type creatures that steal stuff. So, anyhow, that's basically the whole argument, right? So, this, what, we, what, we, what we said was that we had this picture. We had this clustering, we only kept some clusters and they were somehow well suited for hierarchy. There's a little bit of noise because we have to add and remove things, but when we add and remove things, we know the LP has paid at least as much as we do. So this means that the cost we pay is only a constant factor bigger than what the LP paid. This is really because we have all these, in the situation where things are not really nice, almost hierarchical, we know the LP has paid so much, it doesn't matter what we do. Uh, and again, this also provides a slightly different version of the argument uh, actually shows that uh, uh, the integrality gap, you could also just use the LP directly and it's true within a constant factor. And so now we have constant approximation for L1 and infinity. And I think it's a really beautiful question what happens with L2. So far we have this, the square root is not really relevant. Just look at the, uh, of the moment instead, then it's a factor log n times log log n. And, and I mean, so then you can ask, well, what goes wrong? Why can't we get this thing to work? So the hierarchical correlation clustering problem only codes the problem when we're dealing with L1. Because, okay, so this relates a little to the thing I said I really didn't want to talk about, which was way back. Uh, it's just, why is this? Shit, where was it? It was, uh, why does, uh, give me just one second. Yeah, okay, so what's going on here? I claim this thing generalizes the ultrametric. So, so what's going on here? Right, so we just look at the input to ultrametric problem. It has some distances. And we just order them by sizes. So some things want to be close together, some things want to be far. And then we basically have a level for each distance. And 
So now, now who do we want to be? So, so this corresponds to a certain distance here. So who do we want to be together at level T corresponding to the distance dt? We want everybody to be together whose desired distance is less than or equal to dt. It's kind of natural, right? And why does this work when we just sum up? Well, when we get to the next level, if we haven't succeeded in putting them together yet, we have to pay again, right? Because you pay, you just look at how far you are from the right answer. So for each level you fail to put them together, you pay extra. Okay, so things just add up that way. So for each level you get wrong, you pay just one. And that's why we just have a nice sum here. If you look at L2, then the further you get from the right distance, the more you have to pay, it's quadratic. But this means that the penalty for not getting them together when your level is far away from what it should be, gets much higher. This becomes like weighted correlation clustering in the sense that there are some guys you really have to put together because it's high time you're so far away from the real distance. And there are guys where you can take it easy because you're still close to the right distance. Weighted correlation clustering, you can't solve. I mean, according to unique games, you can't get a constant factor approximation for it. Uh, I mean, this is very related to this. Uh, I mean, the LP solution, they have the log n times log log n. It's basically like a multi commodity, um, uh, a multi cut type thing where you use this approximation of Lin Rao or something like that. And then the log log n is a very elegant way of dealing with the hierarchy. So you have the log n and then the log log n for the hierarchy, uh, but it's it's not trivial at all. But and then that can handle any weights and stuff like that. That's why they say they can code everything with the LP type stuff they're doing. They can also care out, have don't chaos and stuff like that. But we can't do that. So so that's one thing we couldn't even solve it. And uh, yeah, so we can't deal with these weighted things. But of course, nobody says we have to go this way. I'm just saying this approach here fails miserably. I was hoping to prove that somehow, if you could do the weighted correlation clustering within a certain factor, then at least you would get the same factor for the ultrametric, because we could do that within a factor log n, then you get rid of this annoying log log n. I didn't see how to do that. And neither did any of my co-authors. Okay, so I think this is a really beautiful problem what happens here. In L2, and then of course the constants are ridiculous as they are when you just claim a constant. Thank you, Michael.